Okay, my name is Tracy Perry, and I'm here to talk about the Wheel of Time uh, retrospective of the series and an overview of fan communities and how the books have influenced people's lives. So, um, disclaimer I am not a representative of Vanderstatch or Teen Jordan or Carbolon.net, though I am a member of Carbolon.net, so they're the group I know the most about and will talk. Here we go. So, what exactly is the Wheel of Time? It is categorized as high fantasy, and high fantasy shares a lot of the same characteristics. The protagonist has to battle evil and save the world. It's often written as a coming of age tale, and some examples are Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire. Sword of Truth, Chronicles of Narnia, Stormlight Archive, which is Brandon Sanderson's current epic fantasy that is going to be as epic as a little time, he says. And because of these shared themes, a lot of these series sound very similar to each other. And the Will of Time, especially, is often accused of stealing from Lord of the Rings. And so Team Jordan, which is made up of um, Harriet, Robert Jordan's widow, uh, his assistants, who are Alan and Maria, and Brandon Sanderson recently addressed this on Google Plus. Um, RJ, meaning Robert Jordan, that was our shorthand for him, has said many times in interviews that the beginning of The Eye of the World, the first book, was written as an homage to Tolkien but that it diverged from there, and diverged it did. But it's understandable that if you stop reading after the first chapter, you're going to think the rest. <coughs> so this leads the New York Times in an early review to say that Robert Jordan has come to dominate the world that Tolkien began to review. He was, as far as I know, really the first um, epic fantasy, high fantasy writer of a significant scope after Tolkien. And so what is the Wheel of Time about? Well, 3,000 years before the main story, people accidentally break into the prison that contains the Dark One that the Creator made at the beginning of time, which lets the Dark One touch the world. That thing. And so then war ravages the land as some people swear to the shadow, some people swear to the light. And a group of men go out and by channeling the one power, which is the power that drives the universe, they put an imperfect seal on the hole that was made in the Dark One's prison. They're trying to save the world. They have the best of intentions, but it didn't go so well. So the patch stayed in place for the most part, but the Dark One lashed out at the last moment, tainting the male half of the One Power. The men who sealed the Dark One instantly went mad. They drew on the tainted half of the One Power that males can use, and they used it to level cities. They created mountains where there were desert and seas, and leveled mountains that already existed, leveled cities, destroyed everything. And in particular, the champion of the light, Luz Theron Telamon, who was also called Dragon, killed every single one of his living relatives in his madness, no matter how distant they were. And eventually they called him Booster. So that was a hundred men who sealed the door. Eventually, all men who channeled the one power were doomed to go insane have their bodies rot while they were still alive, and then kill everyone around them. So luckily, the women's half of the one power was untainted, so women who could channel could cut those men off and stop them from doing this. And failing that, men who could channel were often killed by a mob or other such vigilance of justice. And so nothing in the world of the Wheel of Time is feared more than a man who can channel the one power. And due to the fact that a group made up of only men broke the world, among other 
other factors. Single women arguably have more authority than men in many parts of the world. 3,000 years later, a farm boy is told he's the dragon reborn and he's the savior of the world. And he has to channel the one power and he may have to destroy the world in order to save it from the dark one. Yes! His friends, male and female, have to help him in order to succeed, and they're kind of scared of him at this point. And the Dark One can't be defeated unless men and women contribute. That was part of the problem the first time around. And so, with these themes, what Robert Jordan had to say was, his first inspiration was the thought of what it was like to be tapped on the shoulder and told, hey, you're the savior of mankind. In a lot of books, someone with, with someone who is the chosen one, it's like people split into a group that supports the chosen one and the bad guys. And it seemed to Robert Jordan that if someone is chosen to be the savior, there's going to be a good bit of resistance, both let this out pass from me type thing, and a lot of people are not going to be happy to have the Savior show up, even if they would be on his side nominally. And then he began to think about the world. And he said, quote, what I'm trying to do here is rather complex. The usual thing is to either tell a sweeping story that is, in effect, the history of a nation or a people, or to tell a tighter story that's very much in the heads of individuals themselves. I'm trying to do the stories of individual people, a large number of them, there are literally thousands of characters, at the same time as I tell the story of a world. I want to give readers, you got it, Buckman, the in an entire picture of this world, not just its current history and situation, but its past as well. That's hard to do at the same time when we're so deeply involved with individual characters. And the complexity of that combination is one of the reasons that the series went on as long as it has. So a lot of the themes in the old time drop from Eastern philosophy. Uh, for example, reincarnation, you have the dragon reborn, balance and duality, respect for nature, but also themes from Western philosophy like a good deity and an evil deity, a creation story and a prophecy savior who has to save the world. And there's an emphasis, especially in the themes of good and evil, of recognizing what is good and what is evil and the difficulty of doing that. And there's also the difficulty, Robert Jordan said, in deciding how far you go in fighting evil. And he said, quote, I like to think of it as a scale. At one end, you purely hold to your own ideals, no matter what the cost, with the result that evil possibly wins. And on the other hand, you do anything and everything to win, with the result that maybe it doesn't make much difference whether you won or evil have won. There has to be some sort of balance in the middle, and it's very difficult to find. And so more themes is um, there's the mutability of knowledge. Uh, with that, basically no one knows everything. There's no technology, so there, well, there's limited technology, but you don't have audio recorders, video recorders. And so everyone is operating on incomplete knowledge, and they know they're operating on incomplete knowledge, and a lot of the time they'll make decisions that the reader knows are not the best, but they're doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have at that time. And so that is something that is really interesting to see from a reader's perspective. And then characters will see things in one way, but as they grow and change and learn more, we and they find out that sometimes what they knew as the truth wasn't necessarily the whole truth. Sometimes it's not the truth at all. For example, when Rand and the rest of the group first met Moraine, they saw her as an Aes Sedai. They saw her as practically omnipotent. And it's only as they go along that they begin to find out that Aes Sedai are human. Aes Sedai have limits. And in the beginning, 
everybody says that the White Tower makes thrones dance and kings and queens play at their command, but the characters begin to find out the White Tower has manipulated a lot, but it's not all powerful. Characters learn more about the truth as time goes on, and sometimes find out what they knew before was only the first layer of the onion, which is a major theme, really, in the whole series, the changeability the way that something starts out seeming to be a single thing and it is slowly revealed to have a number of very complex layers. But for all the grand events, the things that really interested Robert Jordan more than anything else were the characters themselves, how they change, how they don't change, what makes them tick, how they relate to each other. The people fascinated him and of course there were things happening that the major characters didn't see, but the readers did see. And there's stuff going on under the surface. Major characters just don't realize. So who was Robert Jordan? Because every... Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's like he is. <laughs> he, he is. But who was he? Because every author's work is colored by his life experience. Well, he was a decorated army veteran. He served two tours in Vietnam. He was given, he earned, excuse me, the Distinguished Flying Cross with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Bronze Star with V for Valor, and Oak Leaf Cluster, and two Vietnamese Gallantry Crosses. What does the Oak Leaf Cluster represent? I wish I could tell you. I am not a military buff. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead and admit that right now. Most likely. Um, um, his military experience certainly influenced the wheel of time. There's a quote from an interview he gave in 1994. He said, the only time I was really shaken in combat, in shooting at somebody, I was shooting back at some people on a stand pan and a woman came out and pulled up an AK-47 and I didn't hesitate about shooting her. But that stuck with me. I was raised in a very old-fashioned sort of way. You don't hurt women. You don't do that. That's the one thing that stuck with me for a very long time. And something else he said is how far can you go fighting evil before becoming like evil itself? Or do you maintain your purity at the cost of evil's victory? I'm fond of saying that if the answer is too easy, you've probably asked the wrong question. So you can see that this experience, which created this philosophy that he had, informed not only the good and evil duality in the Wheel of Time, but the fact that the main male characters just do not want to hurt women, even if the women are trying to hurt them, kill them, even though women may have the power and authority. And so after he got out of the military, he attended the Citadel, he got two bachelor's degrees, one in math, one in physics, and became a nuclear engineer for the US Navy, which he did for a long time. And so it's like, well, how do you get a writer out of that? And <laughs> he, um, this is a quote, um, I had always said one day I will write. Then when I was 30, I was walking back from a dry dock to my office, and I had a fall and tore up my knee very severely. There were complications in the surgery. I nearly died. I spent a month in the hospital, and I spent three and a half months recuperating before I could walk well enough to go back to the office. During that time, I reached a burnout in reading. I remember picking up a book by an author I knew I liked, reading a few paragraphs, and tossing it against the room and saying, oh God, I can do better than that. And then I thought, all right, son, it's time to put up or shut up. And so he finished The Eye of the World in three and a half months. He wrote it longhand on legal yellow pads. And when he went back to work, he typed it up in the evenings, made edits, sent it to a publisher. And the best he was hoping for was, you know, good, but not quite good enough. Keep trying, you'll get there. I was very surprised to get an enthusiastic letter back offering to buy the novel. And then I tried to negotiate some minor points of the contract. I didn't have an agent and was equally shocked to get a letter back withdrawing the offer because they thought that you shouldn't quibble as a new writer. It didn't matter because I decided I would ignore the second letter. The first letter said I could write. So there were things happening at work I found very irritating. I cleared my desk. I completed every project.
project in the pipeline, and I laid down my resignation. And his boss said, you can't go. And he said, read the resignation, I'm going. And his boss said, if you do this, you will never work with the United States government again. And Robert Thornton said, can I have that in writing? <laughs> and he said his wife once said to him when he'd been writing for 10 or 15 years that he could always go back to being a nuclear engineer. And he said to her, Harriet, would you let someone who quit his job to go write fantasy anywhere near your nuclear reactor? Because I would. <laughs> so he's writing these books, he's publishing them, they become successful. And all but the first two books appeared on the New York Times bestsellers list. Each book since the eighth debuted at number one. And then online, Fan communities were formed because people went online, wanted to talk about the books. There's DragonMount.com, founded in 1998, Theoryland.com, founded in 2000, and Parvalon.net in 2001. And DragonCon, which is the largest science fiction and fantasy convention in North America, created a Wheel of Time dedicated track. Fans gathered in real life and held costume contests, panels, and debates about what would happen next in the books. And I was, uh, I was actually fortunate enough to go to two signings and met Robert Thornton. And he was a very nice man. And at, um, at the signing in San Diego for Night of Dreams, there were a lot of men in the room, of course, but there were some women, and he was answering some questions, and finally he says, women, I know you're not here to carry your boyfriend's books. I want a question from a woman. So I asked the question, and he told me where you find out. <laughs> <laughs> what question did you ask? I asked, how long does it take to ride from World's End Harwin's Gap, which um, probably doesn't make sense to you yet, but I'm not make sense to you. <laughs> so um, during this time, Robert Jordan did certainly live. In 2002, he said, I just see my life continuing until it ends. I intend to live. Most people exist. They simply do the job, go home, go to sleep, get up, go to work, go home, go to sleep. And it's understandable. If you have a factory job, you can get very tired and you don't want to live. I'm lucky. I know my life is going to end. When I was 19, I realized I was going to die for sure. On my first tour in Vietnam, the helicopter I was in blew up and threw me into the jungle. I got up and ran through the lines of an ambush. I didn't know it was there, I just knew the other chopper was in that direction. And this knowledge changes your view of the world. I think it gives you a certain maturity. Perhaps maturity is the knowledge that everything is going to change and that neither you nor anything you've seen is going to go on forever. And he said that years before he was diagnosed. Um, here are some fans in costumes. I stood eye of the green Aja. This is a panel from this year's Jordan Con. It what it is a yearly convention held in Georgia dedicated to Robert Jordan's writings. And there's even been a lot of professional great fan art created. Um, here you see Matt. And then he made the announcement that he had amyloidosis, which is an extremely rare blood disease. It only affects eight people out of a million every year. And those eight million are divided among 22 distinct forms of the disease. Some of the forms have no treatment at all. Some treatment that works on one will have no effect whatsoever on the next person. And what he had was called primary amyloidosis and cardiomyopathy, which meant that a 
about 5% of his bone marrow was producing amyloid, which were depositing into the wall of his heart, stiffening it. And so untreated, it would make his heart unable to function any longer, and he would have a median life expectancy of one year. And he said, but fortunately, I'm set up for treatment, which expands my median life expectancy to four years. This does not mean I have four years to live. For those who have forgotten their freshman or pre-freshman math, a median means half the numbers fall above that and half fall below. It's not an average. In any case, I intend to live considerably longer than that. Everybody knows or has heard of someone who was told they had five years to live only that was 20 years ago, and here the guy is still around and kicking. I need to beat him. I sat down and figured out how long it would take me to write all the books I currently have in mind without adding anything new and without trying to rush anything. And the figure he came up with was 30 years. And he was 57, so anyone at that age hoping for another 30 years is asking for a fair bit, but I don't care. That's my minimum goal. I'm going to finish these books, all of them, and that is that. If I get less than full remission, my doctor already, she says, has several therapies in mind, though I suspect we will be heading into experimental territory. And if that's where it takes me, however, so be it. I have 30 more years left of books to write, even if I can keep from thinking of any more, and I don't intend to let this thing get in my way. So, he continued to plan and write as he went through chemotherapy. They decided to, um, if I understand correctly, kill the bad bone marrow, so to speak, harvest the good bone marrow, grow it, and do that as part of the therapy. And he already had tons of notes about the series. And so he expanded the notes that he already had. And he wrote scenes from, from books that would be coming out and other passages in between scenes, etc. And then he passed away. I remember when I didn't know how many died. I have a friend who, who has cerebral palsy and she's in a wheelchair. And we were walking through the library and she told me Robert Jordy died. And I stopped so fast, she almost fell out of her wheelchair. Yeah, it was a big thing. It was covered by USA Today, the New York Times, the LA Times, and the BBC. And of course, you know, all the fans were grieving. <laughs> it was, it was, he was a great man and he died. But the question in the back of our minds was would the series be finished? Not that anybody wanted to say that out loud at first. But. Yeah. And so a young writer named Brandon Sanderson wrote a eulogy for Robert Jordan on his website. And it reads in part, now he's gone, and I'm sure many see this as an opportunity, not a tragedy. Who is the heir apparent? I wonder how many authors emailed their editors Monday asking them if anyone was needed to finish the Eye of the World series. Even if none of them are chosen for the task, there will be a feeling that the publisher needs to push somebody to fill the hole in their lineup. And yet, I sit here thinking that something has changed, something is missing. Some hated you, Mr. Jordan, claiming you represented all that is terrible about popular fantasy. Others revered you as the only one who got it right. Personally, I simply feel indebted to you. You showed me what it was to have vision and scope in a fantasy series. You showed me what could be done. I still believe that without your success, many younger authors like myself would have never had a chance at publishing their dreams. You go quietly, but leave us trembling. So then, this is from Harriet, um, who is Robert Jordan's widow and editor, and Brandon Sanderson. This explains how she ended up choosing him. I had not heard of Brandon until it was the week of my husband's death. A friend was visiting. She put in front of me a printout, and it was the eulogy for Robert Jordan that Brandon had posted on his website. 
Brandon's eulogy was really beautiful and very loving. And I thought, gosh, this guy, he knows what, what the series is all about. Then I got on the phone, called Tom Doherty, and said, send me one of Sanderson's books. And he's a bit darker than Robert Jordan, but the series, as everyone knows, is heading towards Tarmageddon, which is the battle with the Dark One that will decide the fate of the world. Tom said, okay, I'll go for that. We will, we'll go for Brandon. You made it clear that you would love to do this. And that was wonderful. That's what I needed to hear. The next thing was for me to fly to Charleston, right? Drives me to her house. You know, I'm still, I'm fanboying all of this. And you had said, do you want some dinner? And my response was, no, I want the ending. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I, I want the ending and I want to know who killed Asmodian. Um, and you're like, oh, all right. Well, here it is. And you hand me that and kind of wave me into the, the den, I guess it is, or the sitting room. Head over there, go ahead, go for it. And so I was over there pouring over the material. And I flipped way right to the ending and read because Robert Jordan had always said, I have the ending in mind. And all the readers, all the fans had known this. And we'd listened to interviews and he'd been saying for years, he'd been saying, I know the ending, the last scene is in my head. And so I got to read that last scene um, before dinner. Then I retreated to my cave. Yes, um, he did. And crawled in. And put and, up a do not disturb yeah, sign. And wrote furiously for a number of months. This book had taken shape, mm -hmm. particularly for Brandon. Yeah. And he said in the conference call, look, Here's what we're going to do. And it made perfect sense. The amount of material he left behind is what makes this book possible. And Brandon, as you know, lives in court. So it's pretty easy to get stuff signed when you live in Paul Lake, I guess. So Brandon um, completed a series, but as he wrote, the book literally grew too large to be fine. Robert Jordan said at that San Diego signing I went to, the last book will be one book if they have to sell a luggage cart to go with it. But you can only physically bind so many pages. <laughs> and Brandon said, I'm writing it the length it's supposed to be, the length he said that it would be. So they split it into three parts, The Gathering Storm, Towers of Midnight, and A Memory of Life. And he incorporated the finished scenes into the books. He adapted his writing style to fit the series, and where there weren't scenes, he built up what from the books. So people always want to talk about what they love, and with so many people that enjoy The Wheel of Time, it should be no surprise that it has sparked many fan communities. I mentioned Dragon Mouth, founded in 1998, Fury Land, founded in 2000, and Tarvalon.net, founded in 2001. Um, for the sake of time, these are the three communities I'm going to talk about. They're the oldest and most prominent. And I'm not a member of Dragon Mountain or Furyland, so I'm going to do my best talking about them. I am a member of Tarvalon.net, so I have a little bit of favoritism. So um, I attempted to contain it, but yeah, I'm not very good at that. So Dragon Mount was founded in 1998 by Jason Denzel, who now has a book deal. And his first book will be coming out soon, but not the second one. And Dragon Mount actually maintains Robert Jordan's blog because RJ was a frequent visitor to Dragon Mount. Um, so RJ wrote the blog and his friends and family still occasionally contribute to it. And Dragon Mount has a significant presence at Jordan Con. They exist as a community to foster friendships among fellow Wheel of Time fans. They have news, forums, social media, podcasts, and role play. And then Theory Land. Um, they specialize in, as far as I understand, discussing the finer points of the series, such as who killed that book. Um, so why things happened um, the way they did, or what will happen in the future world of the Wheel of Time. Um, they have debates and interpretations, and they talk about symbolism 
and they host the largest and searchable database of interviews with Robert Torres and Anne related people. I could not have made this presentation without their database. It is an epic database. So they're awesome. And they also have a forum where they, of course, talk about the books and talk with each other, debate and stuff. And then tarpalon.net, it's a, unlike the other communities, we're more focused on real life and we're structured after the white tower of the books. We have seven Ajahs for the Aes Sedai and four companies, which are Aja equivalent groups for warders. Um, we want to give them a sense of identity other than just being bonded to someone, which they don't have to be bonded to anyone. Various ranks are available regardless of gender, which is a recent change. You can be a citizen of the city, and then after entering the tower, you can go what we call the Aes Sedai path, known as the accepted Aes Sedai, or the guided path, recruit, soldier guided, or warder if you are bonded. Um, it's a 501c7 nonprofit organization because what we try to do is focus on community service through the concept of Aes Sedai being servants of all, something that the Aes Sedai seem to have forgotten in the third age, that their name literally means servants of all. We raised $45,000 for Hyper International a few years ago, and we hold an annual international blood drive. Last year, we donated 41 pints of blood in eight countries. We also award an annual college scholarship but we do it. And we hold annual parties, um, anniversary party in North America, Britain and Ireland party, Euro party, and we have a significant presence at Jordan Con. So the existence of these communities shows the power that the series has on its fans. And a lot of them have stories to tell about how the series has affected them. So, um, I've got some of those. This is from a fan in. The wheel of time changed my life. I was 16 and really in a downward spiral. My reputation got so bad that I landed in juvenile hall for something I didn't do simply because someone decided I was a good scapegoat. That's where I picked up the wheel of time. It was a real light in the darkness for me. The characters' determination and growth that they experienced really influenced me. It made me feel as though I was growing with them. They battled the darkness while I fought my own battle. Most of all, the wheel of time was an escape. I was able to escape my circumstances by immersing myself in the books. I wasn't locked in a cell. In my mind, it's readers will definitely be familiar with this. And there was this one line, and I'm going to paraphrase it, and I'm sure I'm going to slaughter it, but um, where one of the main characters says, weep for Menethrin, weep for what is lost. And I can remember him shutting the book at that exact line and said, well, that's all we're going to read for today. And I was like, no, you can't stop there. I, I suddenly, I had chills from the top of my head to the tips of my toes, and I was like, this is amazing. I, I knew from that moment on I was going to be a fan of Wheel of Time for the rest of my life. Interestingly enough, um, my husband and I finished reading the entire book series out loud to each other. And now we read it to our six-year-old little girl. What is the Wheel of Time meant to me? Well, um, after reading I Think I Am the World, I went online looking for more information like a lot of people do. And I came across a, a website, I think the first one was Silk Lantern, and I realized, oh my gosh, people actually role play the characters from Jordan's world. Maybe not exactly the ones from the books, but they make their own. And oh my gosh, they write fan fiction about this. And I, I'd never been introduced to fan fiction before this, but once I saw it, I was like, I have to do that. Um, as an aspiring author myself, it was a Thrill to know that someone kind of gave us a thumbs up. It's okay. You can you can take this world and you can write about it and you can explore your own imagination and you can work on your craft and you can entertain others. And suddenly the book series went from something being um, 
it was something that my husband and I loved behind closed doors to being something that connected me to other people and, and not just people in the United States. I connected with people from all over the world. In fact, I have a dear, dear friend who lives in Finland who's flown here to the United States several times just to come visit our family. And um, I, in a lot of ways, consider her a sister. I, I have brothers and sisters now, thanks to the fandom all across the world. I have been on sites and a member of sites actively um, from dragonmount.com to charmalon.net. And um, I don't regret a moment of it because Wheel of Time is like a, a Rosetta Stone. It really does break down cultural barriers. It speaks out common language. It talks about heroes and light and darkness and the state of humanity and what it means to be um, who we are as people. And that's not something that is unique to the United States. It's not unique to any any culture. And while he draws off, Robert Jordan draws off many mythos uh, from different cultures, it's, uh, it's more of a tale about the human spirit and enduring and finding your strength and overcoming what would be easier and what would be your weaknesses. And that's just something we all understand. Definitely Robert Jordan's books have changed a lot of lives. Um, I've been fortunate enough to know several people who the books literally saved their lives. I don't know if people have come to Harriet or to Brandon or to even Robert before he passed and told them that. But I have talked to some young teens um, who have told me that before the fandom, they didn't have anyone. They literally thought they were alone in the world. And the stories that the books presented and the opportunities they found in the fandom to make friends and to find people who had common interests to them, quite possibly, and in some cases they claim, in fact, did save their lives. I cannot think of uh, a more amazing thing to hear if I were an author or just anyone, then your words had that deep of an impact on another person. And I hope that they know that. I really pray that they understand um, the truly amazing thing that is the Wheel of Time. So I actually got to talk with uh, Maria from Team Jordan. And um, I asked her what the Wheel of Time meant to her. And she said that it was a real life changer for her. And that it didn't start out that way. When she started reading in 1991, it was just another fantastic series to look forward to as each book came out. That changed five years later when I scored a part-time job helping Harriet and Jim, also known as Robert Jordan, with fan mail and filing. It started small. There were times that I was worried I would finish my tasks and be out of a job. But before too long passed, I was full time and actually helping with the books. It was a great ride. I had the best bosses in the universe, great coworkers, and a job that I loved. The wheel of time became a central part of my life, waking and sleeping. In my dreams, Cat and Fade stole my groceries and Benji Dalfour called my house. When Jim died, I was grief-stricken. But Harriet led us onward and found Brandon to complete Jim's vision. When Jennifer and Liang started Jordan Pond, I met so many wonderful people there and learned to speak in public without panic. I also went to Provo, Chicago, New York, and London because of the Wheel of Time and met even more great folks. And to top it all off, later this year, a book that I helped write the Wheel of Time Companion will be released. Some days I can hardly believe how lucky I've been, but the Wheel of Time made it all possible. And um, this is from Ida, who lives in Oslo, Norway. I was first introduced to the Wheel of Time by a good friend. She said I had to read it, and by the first chapters I was hooked. And I continued to love it as I read it. When I travel, I always have at least one Wheel of Time book with me. The same friend who introduced me to the series also made me join this fan website. I was skeptical at first, but I got dragged into the fantastic world of online friendship. At Tarvalon.net, I have met some of the persons that mean the most to me. 
I know that I have friends there that care for me and will be there for me no matter what. When I finally met some of them in real life, it was not like meeting new people. It was like meeting old friends. Little time and harmonica.net have also enabled me to travel to other places of the world. I have twice traveled to the States and also traveled to the UK and the Netherlands simply to meet friends from Harmonica.net. That is something I never thought I would do, and it's been a life-changing experience. And when she landed in the hospital at one of our parties, um, we made sure that she was number one. Um, this is from John in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. The wheel of time taught me grammar and punctuation and spelling better than my English teachers ever did. It taught me to use my imagination. It taught me the possibilities of having friends on other continents, people I've only met online that continue to be friends with throughout the past 12 years. It taught me how to grow up and be a responsible adult instead of reacting with anger or insults. This is Rita. She is 81 years old. She lives in St. George, Utah, where I went to college. I actually met her on Carvalong.net and we realized we lived in the same town and she became one of my best friends. And she said, my granddaughter introduced me to the Wheel of Time books some years ago. Before I knew it, I was signed and delivered to the White Tower. I had a professional career before I retired, but it had been some time since I was in school and I did not grow up using computers. Thus, my first benefit of reading the books and joining the community was from being more familiar using the computer. A second benefit was I had to study if I expected to pass the test to become accepted and I to die. I looked forward so much to becoming I to die. The biggest thrill was to be raised to I to die at the Green Odd Dot in person at Tarvalon.net's 10th anniversary party. The most rewarding experience is forming some wonderful friendships and meeting so many nice, nice people. It's so gratifying to be accepted by women and girls so much younger than me and the guys as well. It's been great meeting people from all over the world, whether they're 16 years old or 30, we have a common ground. I really think that when you have the opportunity to talk to people across so many walks of life, it keeps you young. What fun I've had. Tarvalon adds a great deal to my life. And let's see, I'm running low on time. from Susan in Frederick, Maryland. I had started the Wheel of Time book several times in the past, but never managed to get very far because of the size and lack of time to focus on reading. That changed when my gallbladder nearly ruptured, and I spent the better part of a year in bed recovering from a major abdominal incision. It was difficult to walk while it healed, and I was pretty weak from post-op infections and other complications. About the only thing I could do for a few months was read. <coughs> my husband got tired of me constantly asking for a new book from the other room, so he picked up the eye of the world and said, here, this should keep you busy for a while. <laughs> I spent the next few months completely engaged in the will of time. It was nice to escape from my travels through the world. By the time I'd finished all the books my husband owned, which was hard to just get the lease, I was up and on my feet by that time, so I went out and bought it. This is the first book in the series I purchased for myself. What I really went, I really needed someone to talk to about this world, but my husband had a friend with his heart, and, I wasn't, and he wasn't inclined to talk as much as I wanted, so I got online and searched for the Wheel of Time, and I found Tarvalong.net. What started as a place to discuss the series with fans quickly became one of my main social outlets. I've lived with social anxiety most of my life, and the health issues I had and the world issues surrounding 9-11 had intensified my fear of the world around me. Tarvalon gave me a place I could interact with people without my anxiety getting in the way, so when I found out they were holding their second anniversary party a few hours drive away, I decided to go, and I found a group of people that I felt comfortable being around. 
After the party, I was more involved than before. I became more confident in myself and my abilities. I started attending Dragon Con, where I became involved with the Wheel of Time track. I helped on panels. For a few years, I worked as staff. When the director of the Wheel of Time track started Jordan Con, she asked me to help out the first year. Through my involvement in Jordan Con, I learned so much, and I've become so much more confident in myself and what I'm capable of. And this year, I actually used my experience in Jordan Con and at Parvalon.net to help me get a new position at this company I work for. So, this is from Ashley in Durham, North Carolina. I started reading The Wheel of Time when I was a senior in high school. Um, when I went to college and had a tiny dorm room to share, The Wheel of Time was some of the books I took. In 2002, during my freshman year, I found the Carvalon.net community. I've traveled all over the country for our events. I learned wiki editing to edit the library. I served as editor of our newsletter, read head of AGA, and gained valuable skills for my real life career. On top of that, I made friends from around the world, and I know that pretty much wherever I travel around the world, I'll have a couch to sleep on or someone to meet for lunch. In the last year, I've become Amarlin slash CEO of Carbon1.net, one of the most challenging and rewarding positions I've ever held. As I lead and reread with the community, I find that I love the Wheel of Time as much now as I did when I first read them 15 to 15 years ago. Okay. Okay. My name is Kate. I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about how it's in my life. Um, so when I was a young girl, I was lucky enough to have the essentials readily available for my development. I was raised in an environment that nurtured and valued learning from the day I was born. I grew up reading as a major foundation of my life, um, and my father was always reading. He was the type of man you could count on to hold your spot in line because he always was prepared for work. Uh, camping overnight for a good spot on 4th of July parade, waiting for a table at the restaurant, or waiting in line at an opening night for a movie back before I was ever seen. Uh, he, was, he was the man with the book in his hand, just waiting in line for the rest of the group. Growing up, he read to me before bedtime, like many children, by Lion's Belly, and slowly fall asleep while he read to me tales of adventure with quirky characters and lands that will always exist in my heart and mind. He did different voices for all of the characters, and thinking back, I know he enjoyed it as much, if not more, than me at the time. You would be aware that I had fallen asleep, but would continue reading. My first introduction to fantasy was a popular children's series published in 1996, The Chronicles of the Game by Lloyd Alexander. My mother wanted me to read with her as well, um, but she wanted to read mystery novels, and Nancy Drew seemed a little bit bland compared to the universes that I experienced in reading fantasy. When I was seven, my father developed migraines. A year after that, his body started to break down. He was nauseous 24-7, keeping him away from his family that he loved and work that he devoted to. He spent more and more time in bed for three years until his job was vacant for the evening. He attempted many solutions, lifestyle changes, medication, psychiatrists, even an inpatient study at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota with no solutions. Throughout all of this, he had his books. His favorite series was the Wheel of Time series by Robert Jordan. I specifically remember being a child and seeing the wheel uh, within his nightstand collection of books. And I wondered when I would be smart enough to read a big book like that. He owned every book, um, and he bought the hardback copy of the books he had read cover to cover until they fell apart. The last book of the series my father read was Crossroads of Twilight, the 10th book in the series. It was released in January 2003. When I was 10 years old, my father committed suicide in July 2003. It wasn't until high school that I actually picked up a copy of one of these um, for my father's beloved collection. Over the next few years, I took them everywhere with me and read in every spare moment I had. I spent my lunches at school reading them in the hallways. I got in trouble at school for preferring the intense saga over whatever the teacher decided to drone on about that day. As I ended the 10th book, I found a quote in the epilogue said by Louise Thurin, sometimes pain is all that lets you know you're alive. 
I continued reading the series as the seals broke on the dark one's prison, and I related to, to a sense of seemingly complete loss of hope and devastation. I thought back to where my father stopped in the series, thought back to the turmoil and conflict that was outlined so well that even those who have not experienced could feel what it would be like. I continued to read the series and felt as though I was being given a sense of closure by the themes covered in the books as they unfolded. In The Gathering Storm, the twelfth book in the series, Rand, spoiler alert, Rand confronts <laughs> Luz Thurin. Um, the confrontation is reflective of the light within him overpowering the dark. This to me symbolically summed up the conflict that I continue to believe is paramount to the human condition. Ram's willingness to fight the dark comes following a realization of the point of it all, love. It's cliche because it's real. My father was not with us long enough to have his own life-altering epiphany. I, on the other hand, allowed my experiences and my connection to this moment in the book to highlight a turning point in my perspective of life. I could go on and on about every little aspect of the Will of Time series that made a difference in my life as I grew and developed into the woman I am today. But let's be honest, we've got places to be. I am so grateful to have been given the influence of this amazing story throughout my life. A place to escape in hard times, a place where my imagination reigns, a place with complex themes seem, that seem to simplify life and highlight what's important. I hope that somehow it's possible my father was able to experience the conclusion with me as well as feel the love you always have for me. Thank you. <laughs> And we're done.